Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just get started with the introduction. So this is um, the next day of the Marine Seismology Symposium. Um, this session is uh, called uh, New Insights on Structure, and we're actually broken into, into two parts. This is part one. Um, we are, the plan here is to introduce exciting new research outcomes from recent uh, seismic experiments, targeting formation and evolution of ocean basins, mantle imaging, rifted margins, and subduction zones. Um, and our, uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, Richard Davey. Uh, Dr. Richard Davey is a, a marine geophysicist and seismologist, um, a research associate in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering um, at Imperial College London. Uh, his expertise includes travel time tomography and full waveform inversion. Um, one of his current research fo foci uh, involves investigating the physical properties of slow slip events uh, on the Hikarangi subduction interface uh, using seismic full waveform inversion uh, methods. So um, Richard, if you wanna go ahead and share your Thank screen, you. you can take it away. There, you can all hear me? Can hear you great. Great. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction, Sean. Yeah, as a, oh, is this gonna maximize? There we go. As I mentioned, uh, I'm Richard Davey. Um, it's great to be here speaking to you all this morning. Uh, some of you are joining at crazy hours, so I really appreciate you, you showing up. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work that I've been doing in the last year at Hikarangi. So it's primarily looking at full waveform inversion and how we can exploit uh, these models, these physical property models, to actually get kind of depth, uh, depth images of the subsurface, much like uh, seismic reflection images. So if I was to rename the talk, I'd probably call it reflection imaging without reflection imaging. Um, so this is a part of the New Zealand 3D project. So I've got a list of my project partners down below here. Um, but I'd like to just mention Laura Fram as a PhD student who works with me on this. And so this represents quite a bit of her work as well, as well as Rebecca Bell and Joanna Morgan, who are my colleagues at Imperial. So just to kind of start off, I'll give you an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. So I'll give you a quick uh, overview of what full waveform inversion is. Uh, give you a quick discussion on, on the background and why we're interested in the Hickorangi margin. Uh, so today I'm not going to go so much into the geophysical and geology results, but more about the imaging and how we can get these really nice images of the subsurface with full waveform inversion. Uh, then we'll get into the actual uh, the methods of themselves to kind of explain to you what I'm doing to get these really nice images. So that involves deriving a source wavelet and, and model building. Uh, then I'll go over the inversion strategy and why we make some of the decisions we make. Uh, and then really the crux of the talk is showing you these full waveform images and how they kind of square up against uh, your conventional reflection images. Uh, and then I've got a very brief little section on how I see some of the future directions we can take this method. So to start with, um, full waveform inversion, uh, I like to call it a new era of seismic imaging. Uh, so it was first actually theorized in the 1980s by Albert Tarantola, was one of the first. Um, and effectively, in principle, what the, the, the theory shows is that um, if we can resolve the, uh, if we can use the seismic waveform to kind of um, resolve the properties which control its propagation, we can extract out really high resolution physical property models of the subsurface. Uh, however, in the 80s, the kind of computing power required to do this wasn't available. It's very computationally expensive. And so it's only really been in the last 10 years where the computational power has kind of started to become available and make this method more feasible, uh, particularly within academia that's only been really the last few years, which has been really applicable. And a really good thing about the method is it's applicable over a broad range of different wavelengths. Uh, so any kind of seismic data can be used and so I thought I'd actually start with a more, maybe more tangible example of the improvement we get. So within medical imaging, uh, we can see on the left here, we have an ultrasound scan of a breast looking for a cancerous tumor. You can see that the resolution is quite low. It's quite fuzzy. Um, we can see uh, the tumor, but it's kind of a, a very basic resolution to it. Uh, but applying full waveform to this exact same uh, ultrasound data, we get out a much higher resolution image of that, that tissue. So you can see all the kind of tissues within the breast. And obviously we can see the cancerous tumor to a much higher resolution, which allows us to kind of tackle and address the problem in a much more precise manner. So the same applies to the earth. Uh, here we can see a, a depth slice through an anticline in the Barents Sea. Uh, and on the left, we have a travel time tomography image where the um, kind of resolution is obviously very low. We can't make out any clear structure. Uh, it's, and, you know, it's just a very generic kind of uh, seismic velocity model. However, applying full waveform inversion to the exact same data set, we get out a much sharper image. So we can now start to see a whole array of different faults, which might be open or closed within the, the, the anticline. 
uh, we can see now that we've got a, actually got a velocity inversion within the anticline. And so this actually is much more easy to interpret than it would be to use this tomography image, and we can make much more informed decisions with the full waveform outcome. So some, some of the basics of full waveform inversion. So much like travel time tomography, it's an iterative inversion method. So we're updating a physical property model to try and match our data, except now instead of trying to match just a travel time, so in the past we might have just been trying to match you know, the, the first arrival, we now try and match the entire waveform uh, to a synthetic one through our model. So we try and match peak to peak and trough to trough, or as some will say, wiggle for wiggle. Um, and this allows us to go, uh, get an order of magnitude greater resolution out of our data. Uh, so we can get up to technically around half the seismic wavelength. So then that means that the higher in frequency we go, the more resolution we get from our subsurface model. So we can actually get to the point where we're resolving the subsurface to such a great degree that we no longer need to do reflection imaging because we can just look at our velocity, our velocity model, for instance, and see where we have the velocity contrast, which would be responsible for reflection within the subsurface. So then, you know, you can see through here, compared to a travel time tomography model on the left here, this uh, full waveform model, we can actually see the boundaries of the subsurface in our physical model. Um, yeah, so then you don't need to actually do the reflection imaging. And that's kind of the thrust of this talk. Next slide. So the ingredients for a successful marine uh, full waveform inversion uh, are listed on the, the left here. Um, so we need a sensible water velocity model. Uh, and typically in travel time tomography, you can get away with a constant velocity, which is normally around, say, 1500 meters a second or thereabouts. Um, however, in, in full waveform, we actually need to use XBT data to get a very accurate change through the sea for us, the, sea, the water column. Uh, as we're trying to match uh, the waveform, we need a very accurate uh, source wavelet uh, for propagation through the model and then for matching uh, through the inversion scheme. Uh, just like the water velocity, we need a very accurate seafloor depth. Um, so typically you'd use bathymetry data within, um, within travel time tomography, but for this we want an, uh, one which is actually consistent with our water velocity model, so we, we do something to get that out. Uh, and then we want a, a sensible sub, uh, subsurface starting model, so essentially a rock starting model, and a lot of the time we'll use travel time tomography as the starting point for our full waveform inversion. So if any of these things aren't met, we run the risk of what's known as cycle skipping, so essentially, if, uh, what we need is the data to be within 180 degrees of phase so that we're matching the correct peak with the correct peak. If we don't match these criteria, what we start to do is actually match the incorrect peak with the incorrect peak and incorrect trough with incorrect trough. And we get this, this phenomenon known as cycle skipping, which then give us the incorrect result in the subsurface. Uh, so another thing we can kind of do to mitigate this is to use a broad range of signal frequencies. So if we go down to very low frequencies, obviously at low frequency, we have longer wavelengths and longer wavelengths in your starting model are much easier to match than in short wavelengths. So we want to use the lowest frequency possible and then ramp up through the frequencies to the high frequencies. So with that being said, we take kind of a sharp turn right uh, and start to talk about the, the case study. So we're looking at Hickory Margin, which is a subduction system off the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, I'm sure most people are quite aware of it. Uh, just briefly. So the reason we're interested in, in this margin is we see a, a large variation in the kind of seismic behavior along, along the margin. So in the southern margin, as indicated by these red colors, the plate interface is really strongly locked and it ruptures every few hundreds to thousands of years in large magnitude earthquakes. In contrast, the northern margin, as indicated by the blue colors up here, uh, is actually quite weakly coupled to shallow depths. Uh, and what this results in is a really wide array of seismic behavior from Kind of slow slip events, uh, seismic tremor, all the way through to those large tsunamogenic earthquakes. And obviously, New Zealand's quite topical. We had a two sevens and a magnitude eight last week, so it's, a, it's an exciting margin to be studying. So we're going to zoom in just offshore Gisborne, which is around the, the middle of the slow slip event in here. Um, so our line is going to be coincident, or our new experiment is actually coincident with this previous study called 05704, which is a reflection profile through here. And this was really targeting this kind of multiple seismic mode. So we obviously have this, uh, this white outline here, shows the, the kind of uh, offset of a slow slip event in 2014. And these slow slip events are quite periodic uh, in this particular region, occurring every roughly two years uh, and lasting for around four to six weeks. Uh, it's associated with a lot of uh, tectonic tremor, uh, but we also have in the same area, which was why this, this, this area is quite interesting, is it has uh, historic tsunami earthquakes, uh, as you can see by these two stars. So these occurred in the 1940s. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a very highly studied margin just to try and understand kind of physical properties and processes which control this multiple modes of failure. Uh, it's important to note that also through this region, uh, we have a subducting seamount uh, roughly around here, um, which you'll see in the next slide. Uh, and this 05704 line, you're going to hear me refer to a few times as it's going to be kind of one of our ground truths for our, our modeling. So this is what it looks like in reflection. Um, so we can see that uh, we have the subducted seamount, which is thought to kind of entrain water down dip, which then hosts slow slip events. Uh, we have the tsunami earthquake from 1947 right on top. Um, we have a whole bunch of thrust folding throughout the accretion prism, as you'd expect. Um, and so what we're really trying to understand is the physical pro properties, which will make up this plate interface. So you can see the uh, kind of uh, what will be the plate interface through here. So we can image that and the properties of it and understand that to a greater degree. We have a greater chance of understanding what will host these multiple modes of seismicity. And also the, the, the sedimentary uh, prism is quite important as well. We suspect there's quite a lot of dewatering going on through the thrust faulting. So we can kind of image the, the fluids which may be on these faults. That's going to be a great help to our, our understanding. So coming on to the new experiment. So this was the New Zealand 3D experiment collected by the Marcus Langseth uh, in 2018. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with the, the setup of the Marcus Langseth, but we ran four six kilometer long streamers firing every 25 meters and with a, a receiver spacing of 12.5 meters. Uh, covered this area over the shallow plate interface as well as the incoming sediments. Uh, and importantly, it was recorded by 97 ocean bottom seismometers as well. Uh, so we have both the shallow and the deep structure captured in there. Um, and so today I'm not going to be going into the 3D, sorry to disappoint everyone, but I'm just going to be looking at an inline, which is coincident with 05 CMO4 for comparison. So yeah, so with that, we're going to jump into the, the, the process of full wafer inversion. So we're going to use a, an XVT program here in a couple of slides. Just to, you know. Oh, actually, sorry, before we go into the full waveform, just to kind of uh, show some of the early results. So Ryota Arai, produced a 3D travel time tomography model from the OBS data. Um, so here we can see that model uh, through our region with the interpretations from the reflection. And we can see that within the accretion prism, these kind of normal faults, sorry, thrust faults are offsetting that velocity field to a certain degree. Uh, but obviously there's a lot more resolution we can gain from full waveform inversion through that and deeper regions of it. And also importantly to note, there's obviously being a deformation front, there's a lot of anisotropy um, so this is not something we, we've dealt with yet, but it is something we're going to have to kind of tackle in the future. It's quite significant in the areas. So the first thing we do is we use that XBT data to generate a, a, a velocity profile through the water. Uh, we can see that it's quite short wavelength. Uh, so I just apply a Gaussian filter. Uh, if we don't do this, we can actually start to generate reflections within our model uh, from these little velocity contrasts. Uh, so it's, it's important to smooth these out. Uh, in 2D, it looks like this. Uh, I think at this stage, it's just important to note that we're using a node spacing of 6.25 meters uh, so that we can invert comfortably up to around 40 to 50 hertz. So this is really fine compared to tomography or travel time tomography, which might be using a node spacing of 500 meters, maybe if you're fine going down to 200 meters. So already, it's, you know, the computational cost is, is quite evident um, with the node spacing. So then we go on to, to kind of derive the source wavelet, and I won't spend too much time on this. Um, essentially, we make a first guess by stacking about 75,000 uh, different uh, shots together. Uh, so we use these on the first 50 channels on the hydrophone of the direct arrival. Uh, we find the, the velocity which flattens them all and then collapse them all down onto one another um, to get yeah, this, this one guess, which is derived from 75,000 traces. Uh, so then, Again, won't spend too long on this. We go through a kind of a venom matching uh, scheme where we uh, take our initial guess, we propagate it through the model uh, to get synthetics. Uh, we then match the synthetics to our observed data and use the matching filter to update our initial guess. Um, and we get our, our final source wave. So, you know, it's nothing to write home about, but that, that's quite accurate and that's going to do the trick for our, for our inversion. So, the next thing you remember in the ingredient list is a uh, we need an accurate seafloor. Uh, and so as I mentioned before, the thermometry is typically used in uh, travel time models, um, but that uh, has a, a different water velocity to what we've used in our, in our model. So what we do is we actually do a reverse time migration. We take the kind of seafloor reflection out to around 500 meters, uh, and then we do a reverse time migration with our water velocity model. Uh, and that gives us this very basic kind of reflection of the seafloor, which we then pick, um, and it's gonna be used in the building of our starting model. 
So our rock velocity model uh, comes from obviously uh, Ryota's tomography model. So his model, uh, we take a slice which is coincident with our line, uh, but obviously there's some things about his tomography model which aren't good enough. So uh, he has a constant water velocity and a seafloor depth which is going to be incorrect. Um, but we also have this nice kind of rock velocity starting model. So we smooth that out a bit and use that. So to actually build our, our starting model, we take our water velocity model and tomography model. Uh, we make a mask using the, the seafloor depth that we had before. Uh, and essentially we cut these two out and then stick them together and we get our starting model. And so this is our starting model. Um, it's not much different to the, uh, the, the, the kind of tomography model, uh, but the, the differences are subtle, but very, very important. So now that we have the model, we can start to check the synthetics through it. So to do this, uh, what we've done is we've actually interlaced synthetic data, which you can see here, it's a nice clean trace, every 200 meters with real data. So this is synthetic, real, synthetic, real. And so where we see a nice consistent wave field between the two, we know that we've actually got a really accurate uh, starting model in terms of reproducing the wave field. So you can see that uh, as we get to longer offsets, the, the offset, of, sorry, the, the wave field doesn't match maybe quite as well. Uh, and this is, um, this is important for our inversion strategy at a later time. So when we now start to go through the inversion, what we're doing is only inverting to start with out to short offsets where the match is really nice. Uh, and then once we start to build that shallow velocity structure up, we can then start to incorporate the longer offsets, which will match to a greater degree once the, the shallow structure has been resolved. And so just kind of looking through some of the areas of the model, uh, we can see that we've actually done a really good job just with our starting model of matching at least the, the, the seafloor reflection. Um, there are some areas which have more misfit than others. So we believe that this is an area where we have actually out of plane structure, which could be affecting um, what we see in the wave field. Uh, and then towards the shore, it still matches pretty well. Obviously, the shore offsets are matching really well within 180 degrees of phase. Uh, and then out of the longer offsets, it's a bit more misfit. So now that we have the appropriate starting model, we can go to our, our inversion. So we're running an acoustic isotropic full wave from inversion in the time domain. And as I said before, we're going to start with short offsets and build up that shallow velocity structure before increasing the offsets and getting deeper down in the model. So for now, we're only allowing three seconds of data into the inversion uh, so that we're not getting very deep reflections. Uh, we want to just get the shallow structure to start with. Um, and at the full stream length, we're then going to increase up to around six hertz, build this kind of macro velocity structure before we go to the higher frequencies. So just kind of stepping through these, and I know there's a bit of a delay, so I'll try to go quite slow. This is the starting model. Uh, after we invert out to 3.2 kilometers uh, and three hertz, we can see straight away, we're starting to get some kind of like glimpses of little bits of uh, a structure within there. You can kind of see maybe sediments through here um, and increasing that up to 3.4 hertz. Uh, and now we start to increase the offset. So going to four kilometers, we can start to see we're building uh, deeper into the model, just very gradually making sure we don't get any cycle skipping. Down to five kilometers, start to see we're building up even deeper in the model, which is really nice. Uh, then out to six kilometers, we get uh, our greatest depth. This is our maximum stream roughly offset. And now we can see quite a lot more structure. We can see kind of sediments, uh, hints of sediments through here and here. Uh, this looks like a bottom simulating reflector. Uh, um, and so those are, those are the kind of features you can see in the low frequency model, which is quite nice. And now we start ramping up the frequencies. So this just really starts to sharpen the, sharpen the image. I can't actually see at the top of my screen. Yeah. So this is uh, going up to the six hertz, which is the maximum we go in our low frequency. Uh, and each, each iteration is quite subtle, uh, but if you compare it to the starting model, there's quite a contrast uh, of this low frequency inversion. Uh, so now I guess we want to quality check uh, how our models look after the inversion. So again, we have this interlaced synthetic. This is through the starting model. Uh, and we can see that the longer offsets, and particularly uh, in time, we've got a, a quite big mismatch. After the inversion, uh, we can see that we're actually matching this to a much greater degree, particularly this reflection through here. So, you know, before it's completely mismatched, but through our iterative scheme, we're now matching to a great degree. Uh, moving on to the, the, the wedge slope. So this already matched really quite well. Uh, so through our inversion, we don't see a great uh, increase in, uh, in, in the, the match because the match to start with was so good. Uh, and then on top of the wedge, uh, we can see again an, an improvement, but this is one area where we're not so confident in. So we still have quite a lot of mismatch at the longer offsets. We believe that we have out of plane structure here, which should be resolved once we go up to 3D. Uh, and then again, towards the shore, we can see the starting model and then the inversion shows that improvement. So, 
So we're now in a position where we have a really good fitting uh, uh, model at low frequencies. So we have an adequate macro velocity structure, which we can now go up to the higher resolution uh, versions. And this is where we really want to get out those, uh, those more precise reflection images as well. Um, so what we actually do is we reduce the receiver offset back down to around two to three kilometers, and we open up the time mute. Uh, and then we iteratively invert up to around 45 hertz. So just to give you an example of the data we're now inverting for. So this is filtered at 25 hertz, uh, and we're opening up all the way down to around six seconds after the first arrival. And so there's a whole bunch of, uh, of detail in here, which we're hoping to get out of our velocity model, and then up to 45 hertz as well. So we use the, the low frequency model as our starting point, um, and then we, we go up. So this is what 25 hertz looks like. Uh, and so obviously there's a very clear sharpening of the image at 25 hertz, but maybe it's still quite subtle. We're not really learning much more from this inversion. And then up to 45 hertz, again, the, the improvement is much more subtle as well, um, but we have a nice high resolution velocity model but well, we can actually start to image this in a much uh, more intuitive way. So uh, reflections come from velocity contrasts in the subsurface. So the higher the contrast, the, the brighter the image. So what we actually do to image these reflections within the velocity model is just to do a downward differentiation. So here we can see a downward differentiation of the starting model. Obviously, the biggest contrast is at the seafloor, going from water velocity to rock velocity. Uh, and the, the model itself is quite smoothed out before we do the inversion, so it's nothing really of structure in, in the subsurface. And after the low frequency inversion, we can start to see something which looks like a reflection image. So obviously we're starting to see sedimentary packages uh, through here and here, this bottom simulating reflector, kind of the shadows of thrust faults through here, uh, and the, look, look at the Coleman and plate interface going down the pit through here. Going up to 25 hertz, we see a much improved image. So it's getting really sharp now. And then going all the way to 45 hertz, we have something which actually looks remarkably like a reflection image. Uh, so um, if I just overlay some of the features which I like. So we obviously have these kind of folded sediments which uh, go through here and here. Uh, we can also see the stratification within the accretionary prism on a very fine scale and they're folded really nicely. Uh, this bottom simulating reflector actually continues all the way up here. We can actually see it pinching out towards the shore up here and it follows it through and it goes down all the way to the, the toe of the accretionary prism. So it's resolved that BSR really nicely. Uh, we have a lot of faulting through the accretionary prism. So you can see this Popku thrust fault through here as well as here. And then we have uh, the, the volcanic cone uh, being subducted. And we actually see the de Colmont down to great depths. So we can see it going through here. And uh, there's still hints of it uh, in this area. And, and there may even be hints of it down here, which agrees with the PSDM image. So if we zoom in, we're going to just compare this result with uh, a previous study, which used uh, depth migration, uh, this classic kind of conventional reflection imaging. Uh, and so we can see on a, a long, you know, on, on general, the structure matches really, really nicely. Um, so there's obviously a difference with scaling. So the way that the, the images are derived is different. So the way they look is a little bit different. Um, obviously, the, the reflection imaging uses a, a wavelet collapse, whereas this is just a velocity contrast. Um, so you can see that the, the features match on a general degree. I think the actual PSDM, oh, sorry, the full waveform image, gets this, uh, this BSR resolved to a much greater degree than actually the reflection imaging does. So you can see it continuing down here, whereas in the reflection imaging, you kind of lose it. Uh, but yeah, but in general, they, they match quite nicely. But it is important to note that these lines are not perfectly coincident. So they are technically imaging different areas to a small degree. So how much is difference in imaging technique and how much is difference in the location remains to be seen. Uh, and so, yeah, so here's the velocity model which we use to derive the full waveform image uh, overlaying on the PSDM. And it looks like it matches quite nicely. But I actually think the best way to look at the, the thing is through the, the, the differentiation image. So again, just looking at the two side by side, this is the pre-stack depth migration image on the left and the full wavelength image on the right. Uh, and if we look at the toe of the prism, we can see that these thrust faults match really nicely. Uh, we even may be resolving kind of this reflect these reflections through here to a greater degree in, in between these two thrust faults. Um, and again, those folded sediments look really good. Uh, so I guess the, the enhanced power of the full waveform method is the fact that we actually have the physical property models of the subsurface to actually assist in our interpretation. So not only do we have the subsurface image, we have, in this case, the, the, the compressional velocities which is used to derive them. So for instance, across the bottom semi reflector, we now know that that velocity contrast is uh, decreased to around 200 meters a second. It is going to help us inform us in terms of what is the gas concentration, you know, is it gas or is it solid uh, gas hydrate, uh, stuff like that. And then within the accretion prism itself, something we're more interested in, we can see the velocity 
structure around the property fault, which is thought to dewater the, the plate interface. And we can see that we actually have what might look like a little bit of overcompaction on top of the fault, uh, and then a velocity decrease of around 80 meters a second in the fault, uh, indicating that there's it, lower permeability at least and potentially water on that fault. So yeah, so it's a really improved method. We now have the ability to interpret these images to a higher degree. And so then very quickly, we compare these with uh, IUDP drill holes in the area. So I'm going to show you the match to U1519. Uh, so I would ignore a lot of this text from the side, it's a bit too much text. But the, the gray color here shows the downhole measurements. Uh, the blue line here is right to arise starting tomography models. So this, is, this is the starting point where we started from. Uh, and then after the inversion, we can see uh, a much greater match to the, the data uh, through the, the logging at, at depth. Uh, and so this will allow us in the future to actually correlate lithologies with the physical property models and extrapolate them throughout the model space. So we have a really nicely constrained area with, uh, which is tied back to the, the kind of physical properties of the subsurface. And so another thing which obviously you can kind of think about is we have the potential for time-lapse imaging. So I'm actually not sure how much time I've got left here. I might try to rush through this a little bit. Um, but obviously we've collected two data sets at two different times uh, over a fairly similar area. Um, so if we apply the same inversion processes to the same data, we should get out images which look very similar with the only differences being uh, whatever's changed in the subsurface. So I uh, have done the full wave imaging of the 05CM data set to compare with New Zealand 3D. However, I'll note that the 05CM uh, data is very noisy. Uh, so there is slight differences between the models. So this is a New Zealand 3D result. Uh, and then this is uh, the 05CM result. Uh, so obviously we can see there's maybe a bit of artifacting through the 05CM result. Uh, and this is because I ended up applying an FK filter. Uh, and so that's the only difference between these two models is that FK filter. So I think I need to remove that and see if that affects the, the, the artifacting. But on the, on the broad sense, it matches really quite well. We can see that there's a quite different velocity around the bottom semi reflector, which could indicate we have some kind of migration of gases potentially. Um, but you know, it's something which we need to improve on in the future. But if we look at the full waveform images of these two, we can see that they match really quite nicely. Again, there's a little bit of artifact in the 05CM data, but on, on the whole, they match quite well. Uh, and it's important to note again that um, you know, they're not exactly using coincident data. Uh, so the future work is to step up to 3D, uh, incorporate anisotropy, uh, and then obviously think about inverting for other additional properties such as attenuation and density, uh, and correlate with different properties from the IDP boreholes. So one thing which becomes pretty obvious is that we've done this on uh, 2005 data, uh, and globally we have a really large wealth of uh, high resolution seismic data. And so this this, uh, this uh, kind of method is now applicable to all those data sets. And so it really opens a great opportunity to go back to a lot of these data sets and exploit them for much higher resolution physical property models. And we can start to learn a lot more about these margins. So for instance, we have great swaths of data at the ocean, uh, mid-ocean ridges. So we can go back and revisit these with um, this method, and get out much more uh, resolution at these, uh, these boundaries and start to understand more about the processes there. Same applies to the magma ascension. We can start to learn more about that. Maybe even a time-lapse project on a, on a volcano would be quite cool. Uh, but this also has quite wide uh, applications to environmental problems. So for instance, when they deploy windmills, one of the biggest problems is knowing where there is large boulders in the subsurface. So using full waveform inversion, we could identify that before these, these windmills go down, which gives us the, uh, which will save money and time uh, and make these projects more viable. And another one which I think is really interesting is the monitoring of carbon sequestration at carbon capture and storage. So we can not only find the reservoirs to put the gas in, uh, we can then monitor how it evolves through time and make sure it's not leaking. Yeah, so in summary, yeah, we've uh, recovered high resolution physical property models and exploited them for depth images. Uh, and I think that overall this method will be more adopted in the future and they provide a greater way for enhanced interpretation uh, and an easily reproducible results, which will then give us the ability for time varying observations in the future. So th yeah, thank you all for listening to me rant on for half an hour. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, I invite them now. Hopefully you're all still there. <laughs> I can't, haven't seen anyone for a while. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. That was a great talk. Yeah. Um, anybody have any, any questions? I don't see anything yet typed out in the chat, but feel free to oh. raise well, I guess hand. It's or... something which I might address before we go into questions. So you might notice yeah. that in the imaging, there's this kind of shadow zone within our, our subsurface and something that we need to improve on. So this is essentially where we change density going from water uh, to rock density. So we use a Gardner cutoff velocity essentially. So essentially we get an ISO contour representing 1600 meters a second, which is where we make the switch between the two densities. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that's something we need to improve on. We, we can actually use the seafloor for the, the density contrast. So that's something I was meant to mention, um, but I forgot to mention it, so I thought I'd address that. So we have one question coming in uh, um, from Martin uh, van der Ende. Um, says, in his AGU metal lecture, uh, Malcolm Sambridge advocated the use of the, the Wasserstein uh, distance in FWI. I don't recall him mentioning this, but would this counteract cycle skipping issues? Uh, so I didn't catch that talk myself, and I'm not, I haven't, haven't read into that, that particular method, but there are other methods which you can use. So there's a, a method known as adaptive waveform, where you start with a much more generalized starting model, um, and you can actually start to get out um, the, the starting model from this adaptive waveform inversion, which means that you can kind of avoid the cycle skipping. So there are there are ways around it, um, but classic full waveform inversion, you kind of need to have that starting model. But, but I actually don't think it's too difficult to, to get to that point where you are at the right, um, at the right kind of match between phases. Um, and there's also, I, I read just recently, they've got a, there's a kind of a new study coming out where they use machine learning to actually kind of reinstate low frequency, um, low frequency data. Um, so you kind of recovering the low frequencies for full waveform inversion. So you actually have those frequencies there which means if you can start at one hertz, it's quite easy to match. Uh, three hertz is also quite easy to match as well. So yeah, so it's not too much of a, a problem um, to do. Yeah, well, that was a, a great talk. I, I'm also really interested to see how the, the faults differentiate between the, the different models. It looks like they're a little wider in the full waveform, and I don't know if that's actually telling us something about the damage zones. Yeah. If you've thought about yeah, that at all. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you don't, you no longer have the wavelet I guess the width, the width of the wavelet kind of obscuring the, the fault zone. And so you may get a, a more accurate contrast. So at the moment, we've only gone up to 45 hertz. Um, so obviously we're still a little bit, little bit lower than what you'd go up to in, in uh, reflection imaging. Uh, so we're actually at the moment trying to run up to 100 hertz, but it is very computationally expensive. It's more of a kind of proof of concept. So I think in future, going up to these kind of frequencies would be a much more targeted endeavor um, to try and maybe focus on the faults. Great. Well, thanks very much. I think yeah, we're going to move on now to uh, much, our next speaker. Excellent. Okay, so our next speaker um, is Dr. San Mok Lee. He's an associate professor in marine geology and geophysics at the Seoul National University. Uh, Dr. Lee currently hosts the Interridge office as well. Uh, his research focuses um, include a variety of geophysical imaging, including seismic and underway geophysics, uh, data from mid-ocean ridges to subduction zones. Um, let's see, so I think we're starting to do it and there is sound. No, not this one. Uh, it's not this one. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Samukua, this, this is not the video. Oh, that's the- okay. uh... Supplies first. Uh, that's the uh, to wake everybody up. Oh, <laughs> okay. Would you like to uh, me to share that slide first, or would you like to? Yeah, I, I will do this. Uh, okay. Let's see. Do that. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Let me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we saw it for a minute there. It looked good. Hi. Uh, thank you Perfect. for giving me an opportunity to speak on behalf of Interridge. Uh, I became the chair of Interridge uh, last year. And uh, Interridge has, uh, is not dead. It's shrunk a bit. So my mission is to bring Interridge back to uh, back. And this includes... Uh, re-inviting America, US to join Interridge. So I was expecting that uh, I would give this talk to many uh, US scientists, but I guess it's 430, 4.40 in the morning. So uh, I don't know how that would play into this, but anyway, uh, well, I'll try my best, okay. Uh, Again, my name is Seng Muk Lee, and uh, I hope, I mean, my message is this. We want America back to Interridge. Okay, okay. 
Okay, this is a brief outline of my talk. Uh, I need to tell a bit about myself. And uh, I became a quadriplegic, completely paralyzed neck down 15 years ago as a result of accident, fan rollover accident. In, well, this did not happen in Korea. It, for some reason, it happened in US. And uh, so uh, I used to be a seagoing scientist, but as a result of my accident, I stopped. I could not go anymore. So, uh, and I uh, left Interridge, uh, giving all my responsibility and everything to younger generation scientists. But Interridge has suffered some problem. And this, uh, and many of the seniors came to me and asked me to come to be the chair and to bring, to revive Interridge to its old uh, glory days. So that's why I am uh, now the chair of Interridge, okay? Our pri second point of my talk is I'll give you a brief update and the future vision direction that I have. And I hope to uh, entice, have many young scientists um, raising their voice to NSF and to make NSF come back to uh, international rich community. Okay, um, and I thought uh, this meeting would be a good venue to do that. Okay, and uh, Masako asked me if I could speak about Korea. So I said, oh, if I am given 30 minutes, maybe I should share some of the new uh, research collaboration opportunities in Korea. Uh, for instance, we now have a big research vessel, uh, more than 100 meters long, and it goes to Indian Ocean every year. So we go to past Central Indian Ridge and Indian Ocean every year because, uh, and this will go for next 10 years because government has a big uh, project in the, Minya, uh, in the Indian Ocean and we can uh, piggyback uh, academic projects on top of it. And another news from Korea may be that we are building a uh, dedicated uh, big seismic uh, vessel. And <laughs> this is slightly bigger than Japanese Kaimei. And it will be delivered in 2023 or 2024. Okay. So uh, I used to be active uh, going to ocean, including one with Masako as well. And, but um, 15 years ago, I was involved in an accident and I became quadriplegic. But uh, my story got around and as a result of this injury, I became very famous in Korea. In Korea, everybody calls me Stephen Hawking okay, of Korea. So I tell my uh, English friends that, you know, when you come to Korea, you have to call him the Stephen Hawking of England because then people will not know which Stephen Hawking you're talking about. And that's just a joke. But anyway, uh, so I decided to, um, but I mean, I lost opportunity to go to ship, uh, go to sea, but I gained something else, okay? Uh, well, this is what happened to me 15 years ago. We were on a uh, geological field trip with Seoul National University students and students of Caltech. Uh, during, towards the end of the accident, uh, the van that I was driving rolled over. And actually in this picture, I'm still stuck. The roof collapsed and the roof pushed my neck and my neck severed. So uh, I have no communication with 
my brain and the rest of the body. So I cannot even move a single finger. And yet, thanks to all this um, great medical technology and uh, scientific technology and internet, ICT stuff, I'm able to uh, pretty much do what I used to do. Well, um, I've been told that if you don't want this to happen to you, drive Volvo. Uh, that's a joke, okay? Anyway, um, the accident um, also gave me a, uh, another perspective on life. When you survive, come out of such a big accident, you, then, you tend to ask questions about yourself and think about so-called big issues. And um, I also did that. I started reading many books and uh, thinking about um, our existence, my existence as individual. But I realized, uh, although individual, individual people's story may be diverse and uh, different, what's really significant is how we as a human being got to this point against all this odd in the last, I mean, 4.5 billion years of uh, evolution of earth and life. So, uh, you know, uh, what I want to say is that I, I was a uh, geologist, geophysicist, even before this uh, accident. But I became more appreciative of uh, what I do. And, uh, and I'm, in a way, very lucky that uh, I am, I was a uh, geologist or scientist, and I appreciate that very more. And um, well, as important as individual research, there are some things that we as earth scientists owe to the general public because we know much more than what they know. So it is our responsibility or duty. And part of that duty is to maintaining this international collaboration uh, named Interridge. So now I'll talk about uh, Interridge. Well, um, I, my title is from Interridge, from ridge crest to deep ocean, deep ocean trenches. And Interridge is a, uh, some 30 year, more than 30 year, year old organization. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Tokyo, Muramun. I need to get a sip of water. Muramun uh, Juseo. And this is the, uh, the new uh, website, interridge.org. And uh, well, uh, it's nowadays very difficult to create something new, considering that Interage has been very e effective and was the center of international collaboration for the past 30 years. And uh, um, this shows the current membership and uh, uh, what end up people involved in rich science. As you can see on this uh, right side pie, the dark blue is US. So this, although US has pulled out of interest several years ago, you still constitute the biggest number of uh, uh, email lists and member that, that receives interage information. Next is France, China, uh, Germany, and this. So uh, I really urge you to US to come back to Interridge. Well, Interridge 
was intentionally kept as a low profile. The reason was that in nine, starting from 1988, 89, uh, US had the rich program. And then from 2000 on, you had rich 2000 NSF big program. Other countries followed. So every country uh, had their national rich program, US rich, rich 2000, British rich, uh, French dorsal, Japan, Japan interridge, and these interridge. So interridge was kept uh, purposefully small and uh, not very uh, high profile to prevent interridge from stepping on the uh, foot of other countries' program. We purposely made it small and made it us. Uh, uh, with dedicated people, okay? Uh, right now, about five years ago, uh, US pulled out and uh, well, I, I was retired from Interage then, so I don't know what really happened, but US pulled out. And since then, Japan, England, Germany, many countries downgraded. They're still in Interage, but downgraded their membership. The membership is only like $25,000 a year. This is peanut. And right now, the only country that are full member are um, China, France, Norway. And because I had to take over Interridge, uh, I had to instantly raise money and suddenly join as a uh, principal member, you know, I did all this effort to go uh, to serve the community. The reason is that I grew up under rich community. I, the time that I started my PhD at MIT Woodsell program was the time when axial magma chamber was discovered and rich science was taking off. It took off in US, other countries followed. Uh, and so that's, that was the period. Well, I remember uh, going on my first cruise to East Pacific Rise and asking uh, my advisor, supervisor, you know, um, and uh, we thought that the whole entire ridge system will be mapped or sampled at least once. Maybe that'll take 30, 50 years. But because of this international rally that interridge, it took 12 years for the whole global mid-ocean ridge system to be at least one time visited or sampled, and we know the characteristic. So what could have taken more than 50 years took 12 years to achieve by good international collaboration. And this is the spirit that we want to bring back. Okay. Uh, so interridge is based is the interridge uh, the the objective is to advance understanding of mid ocean ridge uh, system through uh, research and international collaboration. Uh, since then, um, many countries have become I mean not the scientists but the government have been thinking of interridge as a big possible um, source of mineral resources. So there is another important aspect that's going on. That's the uh, technique to uh, mine and to do more detailed survey and prospecting. Well, so interridge now has to combine not only the pure basic science, but we have to take care of some technology and applied side. And in the last uh, interage decade of program, uh, because uh, all the ridge has been basically visited or surveyed, um, people realize that just studying ridge crest and the hydrothermal system on top of that is no longer enough. So they want 
So now interridge covers from ridge crest to deep ocean basin. So this whole basin is now uh, uh, the realm of interridge. Well, there are many US programs, but I don't think they are uh, programs that dedicate to, to international collaboration. Okay, interridge works by running uh, working groups on scientific issues where people concentrate uh, for a few years and then do. again, uh, US pulled out, uh, of course, the reason is that US, the rich 2000 and NSF program discontinued, but the United States is still continuing many uh, rich related study. So NSF uh, told me that unless we have new breed of young scientists looking at interridge, we will, it's, it'll be very difficult to justify US coming back after they pulled out, okay? Anyway, that's why I'm trying to appeal to younger generation of people. Okay, and also interridge is a uh, uh, communication between geoscience and bioscience. So um, we have a new working group Macro chess, which is to look at deep sea vent biology and ecology. So um, that's interridge. And, and because of COVID, we had to change our direction, like many other institutes and organizations. Uh, for instance, we have to change visiting and meeting at exotic places to running meetings and talks uh, online using webinar. Uh, also, um, uh, we have to come up with a new uh, ways to communicate and out do outreach. This uh, pro pandemic, this uh, disaster incident event coincided as with my uh, chairmanship of interest. As soon as I became the chair, hey, coronavirus comes and we have to change everything. So well, another thing we need to change perhaps is the new, the new decadal plan, okay? And uh, because so much have changed in recent years and the pace of changing is rapid, there are now calls to rewrite, not the decadal plan for the next five-year plan rewrite into, and involvement of young scientists are important for this reason as well. So as I said, uh, another uh, reason where many countries like Korea, China, India, and many other countries uh, get funding from their government is uh, the idea of minerals, seafloor mining. Well, US is on a different drumbeat because United States uh, did not uh, ratify United's Convention on Law of the Sea and thus International Seabed of Course was created under the UN Convention of Law of the Sea uh, is invisible to United States. But all the other countries have to abide by this rule, except US. So uh, one of the reasons that United States did not feel, feel uh, need to collaborate with other countries is that many countries were going towards the direction of seafloor mining and, and U.S. was not happy about that. But, you know, uh, I tend to view like that as well. But I realized that in many, again, in many countries, that is the justification to conduct, get funding to do deep sea research. And um, right now, for instance, there are four countries that have applied for mining license in Indian Ocean 
and three countries in the Atlantic. And uh, International Seabed Authority itself is just an administrative body, you know. They don't do any promote active research and do anything. For me, I think the actual seafloor mining is far, far away. Still, the this body, UN body exists to do activity, but so they're making a uh, lot of preparation, but I think this is still far, far away. Uh, International Seabed Authority, ISA, uh, recently asked me this set of questions as I came to become the, I be, as soon as I stepped up as a interim chair, you know, how do you address the gaps in knowledge? Because for mining to happen, these plumes uh, not only uh, affect the area they're mining, but the plumes drift away uh, in seawater and affects other regions. So this is a critical issue. So they are in quest of, uh, for the mining to, to happen, they have to know the entire risk system. And I don't think the uh, ISA is going to do it. And also the important is sharing data and also uh, capacity building between many, many countries because different countries have different uh, priorities. So, uh, well, for me, uh, how do you fill in the gap of knowledge? By doing more study, but also conducting uh, remote operated vehicle study. I know that in Japan, they are deploying not just one or two ROV, uh, AUV, but a fleet of AUV to cover a large section. And I think these kinds of technology and trend sh will be in the future. And sharing data, this is important. And uh, Interage has always, always done that. We have a VEN data, which is all the mining con uh, ISA really loves to uh, get hold of uh, and take advantage of and the capacity building. And as part of that, uh, we are thinking of rewriting, I mean, re-updating our decadal plan. Well, uh, that's all about Enrich and let's see, I think, uh, uh, well, in 2015, I had the opportunity to testify under oath against government on the practice, on the, uh, bad practice by Korean government. In Korea, we have research vessels, but this was blocked from academic community. Only government institutes could use the research vessel. I testified and because of my uh, public recognition, I was able to make this into law. And now in Korea, all the ships are now shared with the academic community. Huh? Okay. Uh, one of our research vessel is Isabu. This is 100 meter long. And I saw in the audience, Professor Kawakatsu and Hejong and other people from ERI, University of Tokyo. Uh, we, we utilize this big ship to lay uh, ocean bottom seismometers and, uh, and ocean bottom e OBEM in the deepest part of, uh, uh, in the oldest part of the Pacific. And I think Hejong and some people will be presenting preliminary results here. Um, well, because government is interested in seafloor, looking for possible survey uh, in Central India Ridge, it allows us to make many, many scientific cruises as piggyback projects in Indian Ocean. So um, every year, Korean ship goes from Korea through Western Pacific to Indian Ocean and back. And this occurs every year. So this is a good uh, opportunity to deploy long-term 
ocean bottom measurement size measurements and conduct repeated research because we are you know korean ships are guaranteed to go back there next year uh, another ship which is coming online in 2023 is our uh, new sizing vessel this uh, is also um, uh, slightly and quite big and it has eight streamers of each with six kilometers uh, streamer and gun. this would be Korean lengths. Okay, this is the uh, uh, some of the uh, specs of the ship and <laughs> okay. And uh, if I have time, I can play that uh, uh, short video clip, but um, I think I already used a lot of time, so I will quit here. Oh, you can, somebody there can uh, turn it on for me. It's just three minutes. Will you? And again, my last message is we want you back. Wake up, Americans, and we want you back. I'm sorry to present this at a very early morning, but I'm really hoping that you will come back and uh, like uh, Paris Agreement, you will play a central figure. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, well, uh, Korea has a very small territorial water and they built these big ships and they cannot operate within Korea. They'll be soon running out of work to do. So we have to go really international. And uh, so maybe this would be another uh, incentive for collaboration. Uh, Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we are officially have run in just a tiny bit into our break here, but any um, uh, questions uh, for Sanmuk? You can either type them in or, oh, it looks like we have a hand up. Okay, Michael Brunt, you'd like to quickly ask your hand, ask your question? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sean. Yeah, I, I would like to, I'll do my best to do it quickly here. Um, if people want to leave, that's fine, go on the break. Um, I, for starters, I loved your talk, and I really feel you are an inspiration. You are an inspiration to me, and I think you're an inspiration to all of us out here. Um, I wanted to kind of plant a seed. Um, you know, if you're talking about the future, whether it's the future of Interridge, Okay, whether it's the future of geosciences in general or seismology. Um, my question is, the place to look that I think, and, and I'm, I'm a person that comes forth from it, is in the classroom. Find the teachers, because the future are the students that are sitting in the classroom right now. That's what I've been doing since 2008. Uh, I've been pushing the geosciences. I've been pushing seismology. Um, I've been doing a lot of education and outreach. Uh, 
you know, most light, as a matter of fact, uh, back in my very beginning of it, uh, I, I, matter of fact, I've met Sean, I've worked alongside of Sean with the Texas Revolution. Uh, Earth science left Texas a long time ago. So there was initiative put forth to bring earth science back to the state of Texas. I was part of that initiative getting earth science back to Texas. And through a four year uh, professional development, we trained teachers across the state of Texas for the earth science curriculum. I was actually part of writing the new, uh, new earth and space science for the state of curriculum. Um, my, my thought on this, and, is, and this is part of the reason why I'm here, not only about my interest in wanting to learn more about marine seismology, but also the fact, and I mentioned this earlier, was if you want to reach the future, get to those students through their teachers, which includes um, getting uh, education specialists along these research vessels. On these research vessels, I had the opportunity to go out one time already with uh, Dr. Ballard, and I uh -huh. acted as an I acted as an education specialist, and I did I did blogging, I, I did podcasts, and I did uh, uh, I did uh, at that time we used Skype and something different than Zoom to talk with my students back in the classroom. That's the way of reaching the students. You know, you you get the right. education specialist, you get us to get to them. And that's see, yeah. my message, you know? I mean, I did see, I did look at your website and I did see a program and I wasn't able to access it, but it was called Flexi, F-L-E-X-E. -E. And the, the mission of it, it said, was to get rich scientists to participate with uh, secondary uh, school students in education and outreach. And, you know, but I couldn't access that particular website. It wouldn't grant it. You know, okay. but I am, so, uh, I am an American. Yeah. yeah, I'm an American teacher. I'm teaching at an international school in Bangkok, Thailand. So I'm right Yes, I heard. In, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, I'm offering myself to you. I'm offering myself to anybody yes, out will. there, yeah. you know, and thank and you very Sean, much. It's Sean, it's nice seeing yeah. you again. <laughs> Likewise. Okay. Yeah, Sunmuk, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your education and outreach. I know we are in the breaks. So anybody who needs to go will be uh, the official end of the break is um, at 525. But uh, if anybody, um, Sunmuk, if you wanted to talk briefly about what you guys are thinking about in terms of outreach okay. and education and post-secondary well, or secondary yeah. education. Well, I have more faith in education than before because the reason that I became a uh, I recovered, got back, bounced back right after the accident is because I was trained and educated. You know, that's the biggest difference. So I think, I mean, I say that the single most important thing for people with disability and maybe other students is education, job. And to get a job, you need education. And job and education go back and forth. And so, uh, you know, um, I think uh, I'm glad to see that U.S. is going in the right direction now. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so I think we're going to go on break now. And if everybody would return at uh, 525. Uh, with Catherine uh, Reichert's um, next talk for us. Okay. Okay, well, it looks like it's 425. So welcome everybody back from the, from the break. Um, our, uh, our next speaker uh, is Catherine Reichert. Uh, Dr. Catherine uh, Reichert is an associate professor in geophysics within ocean and earth science. National Oceanography Center at Southampton, at the University of Southampton in the UK. And uh, her expertise includes seismically imaging of the structure of the crust and upper mantle to constrain physical and chemical properties of the Earth. Catherine, you are welcome to share your screen when you are ready. Or Kate. Excellent.
Okay, so it's look good. Oh, I think there might be just a sound issue there. Oh. <laughs> I don't hear her yet. Do you need us I, to um, kick you off of sharing screen for being able to see your controls? I know, I did that already. So now I can just. This. Okay. Uh, can you hear us? Oh, now? Catherine, we're, yeah, you're, we're hearing you now. Okay, but the video is still off. The video looks like it's on. Not so. Okay, no, don't worry about the video. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, camera or something. I don't know. Okay, okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so, um, okay. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. So, I just want to say first of all, thank you to the conveners for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to be talking about a dynamic lithosphere SCNSphere boundary. And first of all, I'd like to thank um, the excellent uh, um, uh, students, postdocs, and collaborators whose work I'll show today. So plate tectonic theory requires that there is a transition from a rigid lithospheric plate to a weaker asthenosphere. However, despite its important implications for our understanding of plate tectonics and the evolution of the planet, the thickness of the plate and also its defining mechanism are still widely debated. The ocean lithosphere is probably the ideal place to consider the lithosphere asthenosphere transition. Because uh, if it is defined thermally in the classic way, then we have good predictions for exactly how the lithosphere should transition to the asthenosphere and how that translates to things like seismic velocity from experimental constraints. As you can see here on the right, uh, we expect a gradual transition from lithosphere to the asthenosphere for a wide range of ocean ages. And also that that transition should um, vary as a function of age. And when we look at observations, for instance, from, from scattered waves, this is a compilation here against viscosity of kind of normal lithosphere unaffected by hot spots. You can see that we're really starting to pick out a very nice trend where we have increasing lithospheric thickness with age as expected from thermal models. And perhaps at older ages, there's a, a little bit more scatter and a bit of flattening. Um, that means a temperature to first order plays an important role in dictating the thickness of the lithosphere. However, when we consider all oceanic lithosphere, you can see that there are a large, um, uh, much more scatter, say, um, and when we include things like hot spots and, and locations that have been affected by hot spots. And um, so it suggests that something else is going on. The other thing is that the discontinuities suggested by scattered waves. Um, are much sharper than can be explained by thermal models, something more like this. And so it suggests that temperature is important, but something else is going on. And it's not just scattered waves that see this. In fact, um, there are a broad, there are a large and broad number of observations globally that have also suggested alternative models. For instance, very so slow seismic velocities beneath ridges um, and asymmetry beneath ridges. Also, the fact that you have very low resistivities uh, um, um, from magnetotelluric studies um, suggests that you have um, something besides temperature. Many subsolidus possibilities have been proposed. These include things like changes in anisotropy with depth, uh, elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding, the oxidation state of the mantle, and also near solidus conditions. These are all proposed to explain some of the observations that have been made. However, they have, they, it's very difficult for any one of these to explain all of the observations from different sensitivities and methodologies. Another possibility is that there's a small amount of partial melt in the mantle. If 
there is. This is very important to know about because melt would decrease the viscosity of the mantle and that would also have big implications for our understanding of mantle dynamics. However, melt has been proposed in a variety of ways. So for instance, it's been proposed that melt exists in a very thin channel, perhaps beneath a permeability boundary. It might exist in a very mel narrow melt triangle just beneath the ridge uh, that's come from kind of magnetotelluric studies, or it could be a much wider melt triangle uh, area. It might exist in a very complicated matrix as suggested by geodynamic models or in a um, kind of layered structures. Uh, it might fall off very gradually with depth or it might have a very abrupt lower transition. And we'd like to know more about this melt if it exists. And one of the problems so far is that all of these really nice observational constraints have come from different methodologies with different resolutions and different locations on Earth. And so our idea was to go and use a wide range of methodologies with different sensitivities and resolutions all in one location and at uh, a different ridge. Most of those studies were from the Pacific. We wanted to look at the Atlantic, uh, which is characterized by slow spreading rates and uh, is predicted to be much different dynamically than the Pacific. And so um, this is part as we this is a Pi Lab experiment, but it also involved the Euro Lab experiment, Ka Lab experiment, and Transatlantic I Lab experiment, uh, where we put out uh, 39 ocean bottom uh, seismometers and 39 ocean bottom magnetotelluric instruments. They were co-located primarily on two lines, uh, just north and just south of the chain fracture zone in the equatorial mid-Atlantic. Um, this is a one-year experiment from 2016 to 2017. We also collected a host of marine geophysical data, including gravity, magnetics, and swath, and there was also an active source component. So starting with the surface waves, uh, what we find is uh, 26 kilometers depth, we find slow velocities beneath the ridge. And then at older ages, we find faster velocities, which is good. That's what we expect for um, a thickening lithosphere with age. At greater depths, 78 kilometers, we find punctuated anomalies that are not necessarily related to any expected age or closeness to the ridge. We can also see this in cross section. We see slow velocities beneath the ridge, uh, faster velocities off axis that get thicker with age. And this is true in the north and the south. And we find punctuated anomalies, not necessarily directly beneath the ridge axis and several hundred kilom kilometers off the ridge axis. We also see a fast velocity anomaly that looks a little bit like a lithospheric drip. Uh, moving on to the receiver functions, we find uh, a velocity increase with depth or uh, corresponding to the MOHO throughout the region from four to eight kilometers. In the southwest, we have a beautiful uh, negative phase that we interpret it as the LAB phase. It increases from 30 kilometers beneath the ridge to about 75 or 80 kilometers beneath the oldest 30 million year old lithosphere. It's very simple and, and beautifully kind of what you would expect in the southwest. Um, however, in the remainder of the array, it's a bit complicated. Uh, so you can see that it's a bit patchy in the southeast. And, um, where we do image it, though, is just above the lowest velocities from surface waves. And so we'll investigate this a bit further um, in future slides. The active source uh, experiment was uh, co-located with the southwestern part where we have this beautiful uh, progression. So that's really nice. And uh, it shows excellent agreement with the depth of our discontinuity and suggests that it's really sharp, occurring over less than one kilometer. So that's really exciting. Moving on to the north, this is where we have more complexity. In fact, it looks like we have a bit of undulation in terms of the depth of the discontinuity. And a lot of these features are also um, not very significant from error. What it suggests, given the punctuated character of anomalies at depth, is that those um, undulations are basically um, problematic for uh, S to P receiver functions. Uh, they typically cannot image discontinuities that are varying quite abruptly in depth. And so that's probably what's going on, why we're getting, we're getting spurious phases um, and that appear to be undulating, but also are very um, kind of low amplitude in comparison to error. And um, 
local Rayleigh wave tomography um, also supports this. You can see that in the south, this is the southern transect, there's a pretty gradual transition off axis. And so receiver functions might be able to image that. Whereas when we look directly beneath the ridge in the north, you can see that we have these really abrupt slow seismic velocities. And so that would be really difficult to image with receiver functions. So moving on, we also did P to S receiver functions to consider the transition zone. We didn't really expect very much anomaly because typically upwellings beneath ridges are presumed to come from the upper, say, 60 kilometers or less, um, kind of in response to like, passive response to plates moving apart. But we saw this pretty significant 20 kilometer thinning just west of um, our ridge axis here. It makes sense because Romanja, of course, is just, just up here. Uh, so there's a ridge, the ridge axis continues over here. So it's centered on the, on the kind of change in ridge axis. And uh, when we look at global tomography, we also found slow velocities in most global tomography models uh, in the transition zone beneath the, the Atlantic Ridge. That was surprising to us. And what it suggests is that we have some kind of sluggish upwelling and that's really interesting. It might be aiding kind of the, um, the addition of hot material beneath the Mid-Atlantic. It could also um, contribute to the motions of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, given that we, it's not you know, surrounded by this uh, really pervasive set of subduction zones like the Pacific. Now, finally, adding in the magnetotelluric result, uh, here we find, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Here we find um, um, low resistivities, um, that are coincident with the surface wave anomalies, also very punctuated in character in the north. And then we have a high resistivity uh, lid in both the north and the south. And then in the south, we have this very, very um, interesting channelized feature uh, in the southeast. Now, this channel could be the reason that we are unable to image that the, the receiver function result all along the southeast because a channel feature is also not resolvable by S to P. In the Southwest, we, you know, we have a very gradual drop off in, in the conductivity anomaly. That's where we're able to image the receiver functions. And that makes sense because receiver functions like to look at, you know, a sharp, sharp change in, in melt concentration or velocity with a gradual decrease with depth. So that's really excellent agreement. I, I guess it depends on whether you are a glass half full or glass half empty person, uh, whether or not you see agreement. I guess I'm a half glass uh, half full person, but I want to say that um, taking a step back, it's very rare, in, especially beneath the oceans, that, you, that these kind of uh, seismic and MT images can ever be plotted on top of each other and showing like really anything that's similar at all. So it was really promising to us when we saw this um, and we found it quite exciting. Of course, um, moving on, regardless of whether you are an optimist or a pessimist, um, joint inversion can probably tell you whether or not you're right. And so the really cool thing about this result is that we plotted up the seismic velocities against the resistivities, and we found a pretty linear relationship. So we took these, um, so this is a, the original seis seismic uh, velocity anomaly structure from surface waves. And we took that relationship that we found between the, this empirical, between the MT and the seismic, and we translated the MT model to um, uh, seismic velocity. Of course, the surface wave um, seismic structure typically is somewhat dependent on the input model. So then we used that um, um, translated velocity structure as our starting model and then inverted again for seismic velocity, or shear wave velocity. And you can see here um, that surface waves really didn't mind having that nice low velocity channel. Um, and also these punctuated anomalies that the MT finds, um, surface waves also did not mind. Um, this all fits the data equally well as our initial model. And so we can find a model that satisfies both data sets and um, is really getting us much closer to what the real Earth structure is. And so we took the new models from um, seismic velocity and magnetotelurics and we plotted them against each other here again. And you can see this is the background contours. You can see there's a pretty good relationship between velocity and resistivity, and that's really nice. Um, on top of that now, I've plotted the predictions from petrophysics. So in black is what you would expect for just pressure and temperature variations, no melt. Whereas if we add additional melt, 
you kind of go down the rows from the pink to the purple to the brown, um, getting to lower seismic velocity and, and, and lower resistivity. And then if you add more hydration to the melt, then you kind of go to the left along these predictions. And what this says is the, predict the petrophysics predict predictions are doing a pretty good job uh, at describing what we see. You know, most of this, these things are probably sub solidus, but then over here, we require a small amount of partial melt, probably up to a few percent partial melt, and that would satisfy these observations from seismic and uh, MT. And so now we can actually put some contours or, or, or say where it's most likely that the melt is and how much there is and how much hydration there is. And so um, this is kind of the, the future of our, 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 this is our kind of work in progress and, and something to look forward to in the future. Um, bringing it back to what this all means, uh, it's really interesting that we saw these structures. I'm very confident that we do have channelized features and punctuated anomalies. Um, what does it say? Well, it's very consistent with the idea that you have some upwellings, maybe a bit of partial melt. These are well predicted by um, these active upwelling models uh, or Richter rules. Um, and of course, these Richter rules have a symmetry axis that's uh, you know, um, parallel to the spreading direction. Whereas ours don't seem to be that way at all. They seem to be on um, the opposite sense. This could be because they're quite young, or it could be because we have this interesting long offset transform um, at the Romanche in the north. It's not really well known, and we need to uh, study the ocean lithosphere more to determine this. Overall, it suggests that we have melt in a thin channel uh, um, in the southeast. Uh, we also see evidence for a thicker melt channel that gradually falls off with depth. And we also find punctuated anomalies. It suggests that melt defines the plate, um, but the LAB itself is determined by melt generation and migration. And within our one study area, this is variably, uh, variable laterally and probably temporarily. What this really does is it reconciles all of the different kinds of forms of melt and styles of melt that have been reported globally. You know, they can all exist actually. Uh, this is just a compilation here. Um, and it's important to better understand these melt dynamics uh, because melt decreases the viscosity of the mantle. And um, it, it, this is true both uh, via buoyancy forces and also in terms of the coupling between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere with important implications for the evolution of the planet, the volatile cycle of the planet, hazards, and climate. And this is also true not just beneath ridges, but probably beneath uh, subducting lithosphere. So here, you know, it's been suggested that melt exists in a multiple channel, multiple layers, or in a thin layer, um, or thicker layers, or in much broader, uh, broader regions. And these actually can all be true as well in different times and different places. Now, how does this fit in with our idea that the, you know, the the plate always thickens monotonically with age? And this is true when you average global seismic models into these age bins. That's always true. Um, it suggests that this temperature is playing the dominant role in dictating lithospheric thickness. However, and this is true also, you know, beneath continents and oceans, um, but when we consider a single transect, so this is a classic transect across the Pacific, there's much more variability in lithospheric thickness. Whether or not that is an artifact of resolution is not really, was not really well known, but what our study suggests is that this is probably more reality, that you have upwellings and downwellings. And this is also very consistent with kind of the pictures that geochemists draw of the base of cratonic regions. So in this model, you have upwellings and that are sometimes causing a small amount of partial melt, and um, also downwellings and melt that's ponded beneath a permeability boundary at the base of the plate, in some cases at some times. And this is also very consistent with porosity waves um, from two-phase uh, geodynamic modeling. Uh, these waves are ephemeral melt-rich pockets that form owing to viscous resistance to compaction and decompaction of the solid flow. The character that's predicted varies by the spreading rate, and these waves, um, the, the material comes up, you know, you can get uh, porosity waves that, you know, there can be more and more and more of them that can accumulate beneath a permeability boundary, and then eventually they may also completely leave the system and be gone. So um, our, 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 our model is very consistent with that. And um, so we can take these predictions from geodynamic models, translate them to seismic velocity, and then invert for them using surface waves and um, you know, surface wave tomography and also receiver functions, and also kind of tell, try to try to try to suss out which uh, conditions we're seeing in, in which locations at which times. 
So overall, the conclusion is that the lithosphere and cyanosphere boundary increases with age, but not always monotonically. There's evidence for active upwelling. And also um, this could be a good mechanism for plate flattening. We find punctuated melt anomalies and channels of variable thickness, both thick and thin. And it suggests that melt is ephemeral. Uh, the enhanced melt buoyancy and channel structures that we image likely aid plate tectonics. And it suggests that a, a dynamic lithosphere at CSR boundary is determined by uh, melt generation and migration. And we have you know, many other really interesting results um, coming out, including joint inversions, uh, attenuation structures, and anisotropy kind of, um, uh, I'd love to show all of it, but probably not in um, a 20 minute talk. But I also just want to point out that this is an amazing time for ocean bottom seismology. A Pacific array is really, um, you know, taking on um, um, via the work of many, um, many um, scientists now, um, led primarily um, by Kawakatsu-san. But I also want to point out that the Atlantic um, is very sparsely imaged. And as I just showed you, there's some really interesting dynamics that would be great to uh, better understand. And so um, now is a time for Atlantic Array. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, looks like we have a question uh, already coming in um, from uh, Diane B. Uh, Warren Rotney, if I said that right. Or Warren Rotney. Um, exciting results. It's interesting that channeling axis appears to be perpendicular to the spreading direction. I know your seismic experiment is designed to cross the spreading center, but is it possible to look at the cross section that is parallel to the spreading axis to get a more 3D view? of the channeling structures oh, oh oh yeah okay so that's a good question so like oh can these channels um be seen kind of both directions and so this um inversion was just a two-dimensional um, um because that's what they could do but future you're right future work will involve a three-dimensional mt inversion um but because of um, I guess the coastal effects that will include, it'll be massive because um, they need to actually model the entire Atlantic Ocean Basin. And so that is what um, Xinguo, this is Xinguo uh, Wang's work. He is now um, just gone to Norway and that is the focus of his um, future postdoc is to um, do a three-dimensional um, analysis. And hopefully it's a similar result and um, continuous, but I mean, even if it's not continuous, um, that's also interesting, I suppose, because it suggests, again, the, um, the ephemeral nature of melt. Yeah. Excellent. Um, any other questions out there? Okay, well, I, I, I have one. I'm, I'm curious whether in these uh, results, in addition to being able to see some potentially changes at the lithosphere senosphere boundary, are you also seeing some potential changes in the upper plate that have to do with maybe hydration differences in spots that are showing up at this resolution? You know, sort of the sub seafloor ocean world interacting with at, at the whole lithosphere scale? Yeah, so let's see. I mean, so the, are you talking about the kind of the, the blotchiness of the MT result at, in the shallow kind of upper 50 kilometers? Yeah, and I'm just wondering if it's also affecting any of the, you know, velocities at, at that scale, or if that's all so, so superficial that it doesn't. Yeah, so I mean, I wouldn't say that those, um, the blotchiness of the, uh, of that is necessarily resolved. And then, mm -hmm. and then surface waves, as you, as I kind of pointed out when I was doing the joint inversions, they probably don't mind <laughs> either way. <laughs> um, but what, I guess what was interesting is when we put them together, when we put them together, um, it did seem like the surface waves really kind of liked having um, a, a model that persists, uh, you know, kind of lithosphere that persists across, which which is really nice actually in a way, right? Because they, we put in this kind of very blotchy thing and surface waves said, well, uh, I kind of like a, a plate that's quite sick. Um, but yeah, <laughs> right. I guess it was, it was one thing that's interesting is this kind of this drip area. So that's, that's, that's actually quite cool. I think, um, you know, as we progress through this, you know, first we're doing this joint inversion, but then we're also doing um, some full waveform modeling and getting at finer scale features like that is going to be, you know, really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Looking to see if there's any hands up as well. Okay. That's 
That's great. Well, I think we are a little bit ahead of time. Yep, we have a few minutes left before our next one. Oh, wait, there is another question, good. Okay, Erica Emery uh, asks, uh, do you think there's a characteristic size of some of these lithosphere drips? Cool question. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the thing is we saw, we see this kind of scale, which is like, you know, say a uh, hundred kilometers or so. Um, we, you know, we don't know without, you know, no, we don't have that many um, high resolution seismic, in, you know, in situ images of um, other sections of the ridge. So figuring out whether this is some kind of artifact of being right next to Ramanche or, um, you know, whether, you know, you, you can see these kinds of scale things all along the ridge is going to be definitely the future, future work. Yeah. Oh, great. And uh, hey, Casey asked a question too. Uh, what would your ideal Atlantic array look like? Would it involve fiber optic cables and DAS? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know if you noticed, but the, uh, the Portuguese are actually putting out a giant cabled array off of Portugal. Uh, that's going to be really exciting. It involves, you know, fiber optic cables and uh, OBS and, and also some integration with client and scientists. And I think that is going to be the future is this full kind of very interdisciplinary um, integration. Um, I have lots of places that I'd like to go, um, but just like in the Pacific, it takes a lot of scientists and a lot of hard work. <laughs> Got great. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, I think, um, let's see, if, unless there's any other questions. I said, Casey says, great, good luck. Okay. Why don't we transition over uh, to Hei Jung's slides. And I will do a quick introduction. Excellent. Okay. So our next speaker, um, is Hei Jung Kim. Uh, she's an early career scientist at the Earthquake Research Institute at the University of Tokyo. Uh, current research foci include receiver function imaging of the amphibious Northeast Japan subduction zone, um, effects of low velocity sediment layers. And we're just a couple minutes early, so we'll uh, maybe get you sorted and ready to go before we kick off. It's like this is a submitted paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can I start? Or... Uh, why don't we wait just one minute in case, okay. I, or less than a minute, in case anybody is hopping on just in time to see your talk. Wow. You never know. Okay. Might be somebody, you know. <laughs> you might have some, some really big fans out there that are <laughs> eager to hear this. Yeah, what? Well, I think that's about right. Yeah, we're right about... 55 after. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and start? Thanks very much. Oh, uh, okay. Um, first, thank you for the invitation to share our work, uh, receiver function imaging in the Northeast Japan subduction zone. Um, this is, as uh, Sean, Dr. Sean said, it's just submitted and it's under review. Um, I want to kind of um, give an atmosphere to focus on the effect of the sediment while using the crossing the shore arrays. Um, there was a session just few days before I, this one. Anyway, I will start from a very general introduction. So Northeast Japan is one of the well-studied subduction zone because of its uh, good instrumentation and the tectonic setting. There have been like passive and active approaches to uh, study the dynamics of the subduction zone and along with like numerical modeling that I brought a figure here, we've understood the water transport in this region. Um, mostly in offshore, there has been many active source surveys to understand the shallow region and passive methods were of course focused on the land, uh, looking at down to deep depth. But Due to different resolution or range, different range of resolvable depths, it is difficult to merge the passive methods and active methods for a comprehensive understanding. So we attempted to use the passive method across the whole subduction zone to uh, give uh, potential to be understood in, much, in a better way. 
The data set we used is shown in this map. You can see lots of dots. These are all seismic stations. They are covering both land and ocean. Uh, in the ocean part, uh, it includes the telemetered ocean cable network, SNET, which has been very famous recently. And there have been many temporal uh, OBS arrays for various scientific purposes. And those are all included for the analysis. Um, we are using receiver function method. Um, this is a tool that is widely used in subduction zones globally. Um, it is focusing on PS phases converted at the velocity discontinuities. The amplitude of the PS phase and the timing depends on the uh, location and strength of the velocity discontinuity. And in case of uh, low velocity subducting oceanic crusts, uh, which is quite a uh, characteristic feature in subduction zone will be shown as like these negative positive pair, as you can see it marked with the blue arrow. To make an image, we uh, implemented the common conversion point stacking method. Uh, we migrate and stack uh, the time domain with your function into space and create an image like this. We can visually uh, catch the location of this continuity and its geometry. <clears throat> so different from the land-based receiver function imaging, an additional care to the ocean side is needed. Um, this is all due to the low velocity C4 sediment. I would like to show you synthetics to give you an idea why special care is needed. Let's consider a very simple cross mental structure. Uh, the cross thickness is thickening towards the left. In this uh, simple case, just crust and mental, assuming just land only, the synthetic radial waveforms will look like B. Uh, we can consider the radial waveforms as pseudo receiver functions. We can clearly and simply see this dipping uh, moho signal as this red uh, inclined amplitude. Ha now let's consider the amphibious environment. We have an ocean on the right side and a sediment layer that is covering the crust. Then the synthetics we get looks like C. You can realize B and C look very different. This is all due to the effect of the sediment. I would like to point out some characters. First, there is a delay for overall phases. And also you can see that they are all in strong amplitude. And there are multiple horizontal patterns, which are all the phases originated within the sediment. Repeating uh, the three characters that I just uh, listed, um, it is a delay of P2S converted phase and amplification and numerous phases generated with the sediment layer. Um, I would like to kind of simplify the explanation using single waveforms here. The set, in case of sediment cross mental re uh, response in the radial component, it looks like this. And these are kind of combination of the cross mental response in the middle and the sediment response, the P response and S response of the sediment structure. You can see that uh, the strongest positive phase is delayed from zero compared to the cross mental response. And there are numerous phases that is dominating the signal as that is similar to the sediment P response in the blue curve. Also, I hope you can notice the Y, y scale difference. There is much larger amplitude when the sediment is included. <clears throat> Considering the effect of sediment is really important in our uh, region of interest, uh, the Northeast Japan, because various studies have been reported to thick and multi-layered offshore sediment, like active source or the passive measurement using SNET, and recent distributed acoustic sensing observation have also uh, reported the same thing. <clears throat> then um, I would like to kind of farther add something about the multi-layered sediment. All, so seafloor sediments are not same uh, in kind of sense. <laughs> so different seafloor sediments have very significantly different effects. 
uh, I would like to show you from show that from simple synthetics. A and B are showing the synthetic radial and vertical waveforms when there is a single layer sediment and a double layered sediment. You can realize uh, the Z component looks very similar to each other, whereas the radial component look very different. <clears throat> This, the only difference in structure is just a very thin layer, but a very slow layer on the top. Um, this causes a drastic difference. We see much more wiggles in case of the two layer sediment. This multi layered sediment will definitely affect uh, the data in Northeast Japan, which we should uh, dealt with it to make a good image. I would like to kind of uh, explain one by one of the three characters of sediment that I mentioned in a little bit more of detail. Um, so first I mentioned about the time delay of the PS, so the scattered phases. Um, all the phases that come below the sediment has addition of the PS minus P time coming from the sediment. <clears throat> You can compare the no sediment and two layer sediment, three layer sediment synthetic radial waveforms. They have a delay of the PS moho, and this amount of delay is same as the PS minus P time of the sediment. The delay can go up to several seconds. For two layer and three layer sediment here, I borrowed the possible structure in Northeast Japan offshore region. Uh, it shows about like three uh, seconds of delay. This can, the delay can go up to several seconds like this. And for the image, one second of delay will misplace the phase, the image about like 10 kilometers. Our data shows this time delay in stack receiver functions in B. Where you can compare the OBS receiver function stack and a land station receiver function stack. In the land receiver function stack, the positive uh, strong peak locates at zero time, whereas in OBS stack, it doesn't. The time delay can be estimated using uh, teleseismic waveforms by aligning them with the first positive peak in the vertical component and stacking them after normalizing it. Uh, this, the time from the zero to orange vertical line is the PS minus P time coming from the sediment. And if I locate this orange vertical line at the same place in this receiver function stack, they locate at the place that we, uh, that seems very plausible to be caused by sediment. Now I would like to explain about the amplification effect from the sediment. Um, the, very low velocity and high VPVS ratio property of the sediment causes large transmission coefficient within the intra-sediment layer. So if there is a, a incident S phase, so P to S converted phase at a deeper discontinuity, it will uh, amplify while it is passing through the sediment layers. And due to the larger uh, variation of the velocity of S rather than the P, the amplification of the S to P ratio is much larger, which in turn is amplifying the receiver functions. The amplification can be expected using the transmission coefficients. And here uh, in the graph, I'm just showing that the amplification differs with different uh, sediment structures. <clears throat> Third uh, character of the sediment is interference of uh, with, uh, with various sediment reverberations. <clears throat> there are numerous phases that is generated by reverberating within the sediment interlayers. Uh, that is shown in the blue uh, waveform here. And let's simply just consider that the cross mental response that we see on land is uh, added with this blue curve in case of ocean. So depending on the timing of this PS moho phase, it may put on the positive trough or the negative trough. Depending on its location, the apparent amplitude that we are seeing will be much larger or it will be smaller or it could even uh, change its polarity. 
the character second, uh, the second character and the third character of all influences the amplitude of the receiver function image while using the OBS data. Uh, a, B, C are showing the synthetic uh, radio component waveforms uh, in case of no sediment and two layer sediment and three layer sediment. I brought these B and C to let you know, realize that different sediment structures have a very different effect um, like B and C. This uh, deep dipping or uh, mohu phase that we just assumed in a very simple structure is overlapped with the horizontal lines which are originated from the sediment uh, reverberation. The dipping phase that I am pointing with the mouse cursor gets stronger or weaker. Uh, actually, it disappears in some locations. While it has a different sort of pattern for the three layer sediment case. The uh, measure of amplification depending on the distance for the synthetics is shown like this. There are undulation of the moho phase that we want to focus on. So in our study, we had to correct the time delay effect and the amplitude effect caused by sediment to make a coherent image of the subduction zone throughout the whole depth. Um, we implemented a two-step uh, correcting strategy that I'll explain through this slide. A is the synthetic uh, that we can expect from amphibious circumstances. We have the ocean on the right, which looks very uh, complicated. We want this A to look similar to the D, which is the land only case. So First, what we did is to correct the time delay from A to B. We can measure the time delay using the stack of teleseismic waveforms by each station and just simply shift the time before migration. And from B to C, uh, we have to correct the amplitude difference. We determine an uh, empirical factor to correct the strong amplitude in the ocean side. Now, by comparing C and D, we can realize a very coherent dipping positive phase throughout the profile. This is what we did with the uh, Northeast Japan data. We selected two profiles for receiver function imaging. Uh, they have pros and cons. <laughs> From North to South, there are profile N and S. For profile N, they have a continuous distribution of piercing points, whereas the number of piercing points is not very large. For profile S, there is a discontinuity in the coverage of piercing points. However, they're in the middle of the densest OBS coverage, which we can avoid the noisiness of the OBS data to get a better image. This slide shows the time delay effect and the amplitude effect that is shown in our um, imaging process. The map first shows the measured time delay in the OBSs we use, and you can realize that the values are very heterogeneous. It's difficult to say any whether there is any existing tendency. And the right side, it is showing the varying amplitude uh, in our image. <clears throat> that, so we measured the maximum amplitude at each horizontal location uh, to measure the amplitude ratio between land and ocean with respect to the dipping positive rates. You can realize the blue dots and the Black dots have a very large scale difference. This is all to the sediment effect that I just explained to you earlier. And also I forgot to mention that there is an undulation of the amplitude. And this is just what uh, I showed you from the synthetics that has undulation depending on the horizontal location. So the significance of uh, our 
um, two-step correction method can be realized from here. The top row shows the image after time and amplitude correction. The second row is showing when the time is not corrected. <clears throat> the right side is the ocean part, and you can, I hope you can see that there is a difference in the positive phases on the right side for both profiles. Uh, these profile that I am pointing now with my mouse cursor is from the phase from the sediment basement. They locate at depths deeper than 20 kilometers, of which, of course, should be corrected for a coherent image. The third row on the bottom shows when the amplitude is not corrected. As I showed you in the synthetics, the amplitude is much stronger in the ocean and weak in the land. And this is not due to a stronger velocity discontinuity in the ocean. It is an artifact from the sediment. This, of course, should be corrected, uh, which will result on the top row. So we use this uh, all corrected images to make an interpretation with the uh, crossing the shore uh, receiver function image. <clears throat> there is uh, a famous study, Kakpats and Watada, uh, that discusses the receiver function image in this region. And we could extend this image to farther shallower part um, like these, these profile NNS images that you see on the left top. Uh, the black uh, curves are actually the positive topographies, so it means it's land. The right part of the orange vertical line is where we have the ocean. So first uh, implication of our study is that we widened the imaging region uh, that has not been imaged with receiver functions before. <clears throat> By comparison with the previous study, we could identify the coherent structural features like these uh, red and blue lines and the pink line on for the left. Um, we see we could coherently map the dipping oceanic crust to the shallower depths. And from this image, the negative positive pair, even under the ocean, we can see that the oceanic crust exists as low velocity in the offshore region. Also, we see some uh, shallower structural discontinuities, which we named as 4R crustal discontinuity, which seem to have a correlation or relation with other study uh, discussing the offshore Northeast Japan. <clears throat> From the image, we could capture along subduction variability. These are uh, due to either uh, artifact from the sediment phases uh, that it, we can capture from the discontinuous oceanic moho. I guess I, it's better to see from this slide. Uh, there is a discontinuity of the positive phase in some places, and we guess these are from the interference with the sediment phases. The variability are, could be are, are due to the real structural features. Um, there is a positive vertical amplitude. Um, we see our functions are actually difficult to image vertical structures, but the location of this positive uh, amplitude coincides with the tomography model um, in profile S. So the negative velocity perturbation in the tomography has a good agreement in location. Also, we don't see a clear moho, continental moho, in the eastern part of the land, and also that continues to the ocean, whereas the active sources state that they clearly see the uh, reflection phases. And you guess these may be due to, uh, this may indicate a serpentinized mantle, so less uh, S-velocity contrast, or it could only be imaged with the high frequency signals. As I've been uh, talking about the C4 sediments, um, there is one more um, sediment thing that 
should be considered, it's on land. <clears throat> our the VCR function images in this region is known to show a deeper continental moho compared to the active source. And we guess uh, this has this is also due to the low velocity surface covering sediments. And the location of stations that has the time delay has good correlation with the um, geological map in Japan. So this is the last slide. Um, with we could image the Northeast Japan subduction zone using receiver functions of the MPPS data set, and we could identify the significant time delay and amplitude effects on receiver functions coming from the low velocity seafloor sediment. We were able to correct those effects to significantly improve the image across this region, and the image that has the widest spatial coverage in, uh, in terms of receiver function imaging provides a potential for discussing new structural features. And yeah, if you have questions, you can ask me now or reach us farther through the email. Thank you. Excellent, thanks for a great talk. Um, all right, questions from anyone? So I, I guess I'll ask a, a first one. Um, oh wait, we have one here. Uh, so let's see, from Catherine Reichert. Um, others have suggested that eclatization makes the crust invisible beneath 40 kilometers depth. Your discontinuities are quite deep. Have you considered that that layer could be something else? Ah, uh, uh, you mean uh, regarding the subducting ocean of crust? Oh, uh, so, um, well, in this cold, uh, so. In this cold Northeast Japan subduction zones, uh, also numerical studies suggest uh, it, uh, de it starts to dehydrate from, okay, I want to go forward. It starts to dehydrate from at least deeper than 40 kilometer depth and the dehydration and the rehydration of the above mental is shown like uh, these positive signals. Um, I guess this is much well uh, discussed in Kawakatsu and Watara 2006. Okay, other questions? All right, great. So I, I, have a, I have one. So if you were to design a way to get an even higher resolution or improved imaging experiment, what, what would you, and you had you know, unlimited resources. What 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 would be the the optimum way to image something at this depths when you're looking for these subducting sediment or, or sedimentary layers like this? Oh, um, for the sediment, um, well, I guess um, <laughs> uh, high resolution. Well, the highest resolution will be active source, but in terms of passive sources. Um, I guess the attempt done but with the distributed acoustic sensing in this region was very good to get a continuous structure with passive methods. <laughs> For here, uh, there is SNET uh, that has very high frequency sensors like 15 hertz and that can be used, but um, as as, also, as it's also seen in uh, Dr. Davies talk, the sediment basement has very um, heterogeneous shape. And I don't know whether the point-wise analysis could make, uh, could help us to distinguish whether it's an artifact or whether it's a real structure uh, when it's showing very different values depending on a neighboring station. Actually, this happens for us, our PS minus P time measurements. Um, it, it's very different depending on locations. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether I answered your question there. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's actually, that's very helpful. Okay, other questions from anybody? All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for, uh, for a great talk. Um, and to all of our, our speakers this morning. Um, and uh, Casey, I guess we can, 
we can go ahead and wrap this first session up unless there's any additional questions for um, uh, Hei Jung or any of the other speakers.